Centro Primo Levi, we have the director here, and the Casa Italiana, director uh, Stefano Albertini, but I want to read a list of the, the partners involved in this enterprise, because it has, it was something that we sat around a table and thought about some time ago, and it has developed in a really encouraging way, so we are partnering <coughs> besides the Casa Italiana di Marimo, and our department, the Skirbel Department of Hebrew and Judaic Studies, the Center for Jewish Studies at CUNY Graduate Center, the Center for Jewish and Israel Studies at Columbia University, and the Center for Jewish Studies at UCLA, the Viterbi Program in Mediterranean Jewish Studies. So we have all angles covered. And, and, and in a sense, this um, enlargement of, of things is um, a testament to the growing audience for this kind of work, and also um, the importance of featuring this kind of work, which is, um, we believe, new and groundbreaking work. Um, in this case, we are welcoming Marina Cafiero, who is professor of modern history at the University of Rome La Sapienza, and Serena Pitinepi, who is a researcher in history at the same university. And Professor Cafiero, a very distinguished scholar, uh, has published a book, Forced Baptisms, Histories of Jews, Christians, and Converts in Papal Rome, and will be addressing this, this kind of history that was really um, not talked about for many, many reasons enough, the interchanges between um, Jews and Christians that really reflect the fabric of everyday life as it was lived, but um, perhaps historiography had set on two different <coughs> paths. Um, and this is one direction we are very much encouraging with this seminar. Um, another is the kind of um, other kinds of connections that were for too long buried uh, of the different peoples in the Mediterranean and kind of um, circulations around the Mediterranean uh, centered on Jews but involving Muslims and many, many other peoples. Um, these kind of, again, everyday circulations <coughs> on the basis of culture, commerce, policy that have really gotten, um, have been forgotten. So we're very happy to host this seminar, which is, we believe, is kind of uncovering um, uh, through this wonderful research um, these, these kind of hidden histories. So thank you. And Natalia Indrimi, the director of the Centro Primo Levi. I'll say just a few words. Uh, thank you to Ruth ben and Stefano Albertini for hosting this, uh, us in this wonderful uh, space and uh, having conceived with us um, this series of seminars that happen every six months, uh, roughly. And uh, every six months we bring a scholar, or in this case two scholars from Italy, uh, to discuss new research and new, new archival uh, um, uh, uh, discoveries that uh, that are happening on that side of the uh, world. Um, I think we have. Uh, yeah, I <laughs> wanted to add something, but I won't take. I don't want to take time from our speakers who have uh, come from a long trip. They presented at the um, at the conference of the Renaissance Society in San Diego and at UCLA, who is um, that is one of our partners. So please. Uh, now enjoy the, the presentation. Uh, Marina Caffiero will uh, um, present her uh, papers uh, for about 20 minutes uh, and then Serena Dinepi. And after this, we'll open to uh, a discussion. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, first of all, 
I thank, thank uh, the organizers of the seminar, il centro Primo Levi, la casa italiana Zerilli Merimò, il dipartimento eh, e I thank also all participants. Um, I apologize too for my English, <laughs> it's not uh, so good and uh, please uh, tell me when I, I have five minutes uh, for, um, for to finish. The title of my paper is uh, uh, Beyond the Ghetto, New Research Perspectives on the History of the Jews in Italy. And uh, uh, I, I read it. The history of the Jews and that of the Christians amount to a history of institutional, social and cultural interactions and exchanges which are impossible to separate. From a Ziv point of view, the new researches published in Italy about the early modern age and the period of the ghettos, 16th, 16th, uh, 19th centuries, present historiographical innovations of great interest. These studies, based on the rigorous, no? No, no, no. no. Più vicino? No, it's only for the okay. solo per la videocamera, non oh. amplifica. Oh, ok. <laughs> ok? No, non amplifica, può parlare di forte. Ok. Eh, beh, io ho una voce abbastanza. <laughs> <laughs> These studies, these studies, based on the rigorous analysis of neglected documentary sources and archives, shed light on the history of the Jewish, Jewish minority and the, his relationship with the Christian society from a new perspective and with unexpected outcome. The Jewish experience <coughs> in the Italian peninsula so subject to rules and restriction appears as an essential component <coughs> of, the so of, of the society at large. Therefore, the fear generated by the contact with the Jewish difference and the fear of the possible contamination of the Christian society could also take a different turn it could um, become a source of charm for these prohibited relations, a source of curiosity and desire to know and to engage in conversation and relations. But obviously, without implying acceptance of equality, neither recognition of difference nor end of prejudice and intolerance. <coughs> The history of the Jews is reframed as playing a fundamental role in the European transformational processes, offering insight into historical phenomena of general interest, such as the definition of heresy, the book hunt and book burning, inter the interpretation of witchcraft, the sexual exchanges, the construction of the lexicon of prejudice, the discrimination, the discourse on rights and citizenship, the development of international trade and cross-cultural exchanges, and so on. Within the, this interpretative framework, my book, Dangerous Liaison, Liaison eh, ho tradotto così, Connection, <laughs> Uh, dangerous connections, Jews and Christians between heresy, witchcraft and forbidden books, aims at contributing to connecting the two histories and exploring the, the relationships and exchanges between the Jewish minority and the Christian majority. Also, the religious and secular powers regarded the Jews as different and therefore dangerous they participated in most aspects of daily life in the Italian cities of the time. The paradigm foreigner's familiarity perfectly applies to Jewish diversity and it refers to the contradiction 
difficult to dissolve between the integration and the keeping of the different, different identity. My research points to a significant gap between the rules governing the Jewish minority and their actual impact on individual lives. Despite severe restrictions, Jews and Christians often found places and time for ongoing discussion and cross-cultural interchange. In other words, the Italian society during the early modern era was characterized by a, fair, a far greater freedom and open-mindedness than its own rules and prohibitions suggest. Even so, the debate uh, is still in progress. One of the historiographical, historiographical tenets in the field is that the ghettos in modern Italy were not isolated spaces, impermeable and disconnected from the rest of society. Many scholars have focused on economic uh, cultural exchanges mm -hmm. and uh, since the 80s the paradigm of inter-ethnic and inter-religious trade has become central to the investigations of the economic history. My contribution instead focuses on the model of exchange in terms of social, cultural and institutional network and, pitch and pictures a connected history. In this context, I, in the discussion, I will raise issues relating to spaces, books, affections, languages. Point, point one, shared and negotiated spaces. The interpretative paradigm of intercultural trade, considered as a metaphor, characterized by common language and codes and by shared use, as well as the image of the non-separation, are first of all applicable in the social and cultural, and cultural sphere to Jewish places. Places which were not limited to the ghetto and that occasioned, occasioned negotiations of space with the Christians. In the Italian cities, the Jews could go in and out of the ghetto, creating a widespread network of Jewish physical presence, then that the absolute central role of Serraglio, the ghetto, has led, has led to ignore. In fact, some physical and cultural spaces were shared and always negotiated as contact zones. During their daily activities, the Jews frequented the Christian streets, squares, markets, taverns, shops, and went into Christian houses, into churches, and even into female monasteries where they sold decorations and clothes. In Modena, at the beginning of the 18th century, occurred a particularly dramatic case involving a, a nun who, several years earlier, had converted from Judaism to Christianity. She had become accustomed to meet with her ex-co-religionists, uh, entertain in conversation and advice, and exchange of material gifts. The Jews wanted to obtain from her the most precious gift, her return to Judaism. The Inquisition Tribunal uh, defined, defined the relationship as a case of seduction and terminated it. The same word seduction usually indicated the strictly prohibited sexual relationships between, between Christians and Jews. In this episode, the exchange caused tragic consequences. The other nuns denounced the woman and she was later found dead in the well of the cluster. 
The case poses a problem concerning the metaphoric di dynamics of economic exchange, the modes of trust, reliance, credit, reciprocity, and reputation, but also um, excuse me but also the exchange of information social and trust networks be between distinct and even hostile communities that in one way or the other cooperated with one other books are paradigmatic arena the Jews bought forbidden and heretical books and they jealousy, jealously guarded and read them. Moreover, they lent such books to their Christian acquaintances and let them, rim, uh, them read. In 1731 in Vercelli, a little uh, community of uh, the north, Italy, a Jew was reported to the Roman, Roman Inquisition for two reasons, the possessor of book of sorcery, but also for his will to lend it to a Christian man, insisting for him to read it. A dangerous gift, therefore, but a gift that demonstrated a relationship made of confidence and reliance. The same happened in the case of exchange of amulets, which the Jews donated or sold to their trustworthy, uh, trustworthy, uh, trustworthy Christian acquaintances, like uh, uh, the famous uh, Leon of Modena, who uh, sold the uh, amulets. Point two, dangerous books. An intercultural exchange implies a shared language <coughs> discursive conventions, rules, and practices that facilitate relationships <coughs> and trust among different groups. It was not unusual that the Jews practiced magic and sorcery along with the Christians and even with some clergymen. Their cultural Kabbalistic tradition was useful for the Christian magician who relied on Jewish books and the Hebrew mysterious language in order to make spells and amulets. Recent trends in the study of witchcraft, magic and sorcery in the early modern age in Italy have not focused on the link between these practices and Judaism, nor do they generally focus on the reason of the evident interest of inquisitor for Jewish witchcraft and sorcery. We can argue that the surveillance of the inquisitors, uh, inquisitors on the sorcery of the Christian was induced by the fear of Jewish contamination in this field. Available, available documentation confirms the link between witchcraft and Hebraism or the complicity and influence of the Jews with their ability to disseminate dangerous legends and belief through their books. Example of this phenomenon is the belief in dreams and uh, their interpretations, in demons, in Lilith, the first Eve who was considered dangerous for the survival of newborns. Jewish books were the vehicles of the belief and legends that, that alarmed the authorities and were considered <coughs> dangerous for the Christians. These books, therefore, were deemed dangerous and became themselves the object of persecution. Such texts, however, were forbidden not only because they were magical or superstitious or because they derived from the dangerous Talmud, but above all because they reported legends and traditions that were already present in Christian culture. Prohibitions, in short, related to the larger society and applied to books that constituted 
Common Traditional traditional foundation of imagery even if in different languages. <coughs> Point three, mutual knowledge and effective relationship. Jewish Christian relationships were above all mediated by the individu individuals, individuals and their ability to establish liaison, connection, share languages, code and customs. Root the individual practices is an entire universe of discourses, comparison, knowledge, mutual evaluation and interpretation of respective religions and beliefs. Sample Cinque minuti? Taglio. No, no, taglio. Is not uh, sample curiosity, case, questions and requests of information, provocation and also verbal violence, uh, culminating for the Jews in the crime of cursing. Such were the, uh, the ways that reveal both the Jewish imagery and the perception of Christianity, or vice versa, the Christian imagery and the perception of the Jews. Both groups confronted and questioned their beliefs. They also showed a theological knowledge or of the basis of their own faith and of the faith of the others. There is another aspect, disquieting indeed for the judges, that is significant and sometimes astonishing for the historians. For instance, a uh, Christian girl, Anna Maria Gazzoli, gave uh, her virginity and her faith to a Jew in exchange for getting married and settling down. Frequent were, al were also the cases of Jews who gave presents to Christian women in order to have sexual approach and thus challenging the crime of adultery. However, here, not only we are confronted with the situation where the exchange is close to buying and selling or has, or has an instrumental meaning, we are often before authentic, affective and not only material exchanges. The history of affective, intimate and sexual relationships among members of the two communities and has not yet been investigated, even if perhaps it represents the central and most significant issue of the relations between Jews and Christians. This issue involves the possibility of changes in iteration uh, capable of challenging very fear prohibition whose transgression was severely punished. <laughs> the occurrence of many forbidden loves that is found in the archives pictures a society that is more geographical and religiously mobile than the one we usually imagine. They also delineate the absolute central role of women and their capacity of evaluating, making the decision and uh, taking daring initiatives. It is the picture of a society capable of constructing multiple identities where the difference coexists only apparently, apparently without great tension between different <coughs> faiths. Uh, there is a four point, but uh, I don't know if... Uh, a four point, the last, the lexicon of the antisemitism, definition and concepts. Uh, we will cut. The relationships uh, of the Jews uh, with the outside world and their interaction with the economical and cultural develop, deve development of the society did also produce uh, oppositional and contrary reactions and negative consequences. For instance, changes in the economic stru structure and practices which started restraining the traditional protectionist, protectionist and the <coughs> corporatist approach to the benefit of, of the open market also affected the Jews, offering them the possibility of, of expansion, 
but also also exposing them to the wider economic and the religious hostility of the Christian world. All the charges of conspiracy began to emerge again in late modern age, when Jews were accused of poisoning Christians is an old accusation. Traditional definitions re-emerged, including the connotation of perfidious, treacherous, is the language of the anti-Semitism including the connotation of perfidious, treacherous, would accompany uh, the Jews until the present times. An example can be, can be found in the Cato Catholic liturgy of Good Friday, which was uh, reformed only in 1962 by the Second Vatican Council. By insisting on e exchanges and relations, I don't want to sustain a falsely idyllic and comforting history against the usual theory of persecution <coughs> and the Christian obsession for conversion. conversion. For this reason, I have also tackled the history of repression and proselytizing attitudes. attitudes. The strict system of censorship, the destruction of the Jewish books, the paradoxical equivalence between Jews and heretics, and the practice of forced preaching and baptism. These phenomena have heavily influenced the representation of the Jews as internal enemies, dangerous for the society. Above all, in order to justify their repression, they have forced the Jews into the category of heresy, which, uh, from a Jewish perspective, has neither meaning nor legitimacy. The hunt for heretical books and the hunt for heretical Jews became two aspects of the same process, and the word Holocaust of the books, which was used for book burnings during the, the 16th century, ominously anticipates the Holocaust of Jews as people in the 20th century. Nevertheless, documents point to a variety of individual behaviors characterized by great material and intellectual liberty when gouged against known prohibition and rules. The study of cases that were present, presented before the Inquisition Tribunal confirmed the capacity of the, of the institution to control, discipline, and assimilate the author through form of ongoing discrimination aimed at erasing otherness. But what stands before our eyes is that these free and flexible behaviors occurred and that by mining the archives we are becoming aware of an impressive number of them. The large documentation that has so far emerged hints to strong possibilities that this web of personal liaison was certainly more pervasive and influential. Thank you. with the Serena Dinetti's paper, which um, is dedicated to the building and the transformation of Jewish institutions within the ghetto in the uh, Sorry, to, uh, the building and the transformation of the ins Jewish institution, Jewish leadership within, uh, after the, the, the creation of the ghetto. And, and then we'll, uh, we'll uh, have a discussion with you. Serena Dinetti. Thank you very much for inviting me, and um, thank you again for um, coming here, even with this bad weather condition. 
uh, I made a lot of cuts in the last minute and I hope to stay in my time. Today I intend to discuss the history of Italian Jewish institutions during the ghetto era through the analysis of the ruling class in charge to lead them. In particular, I will consider the case of Rome in the second half of the 16th century, just after the establishment of the ghetto, which was decreed in 1555. This paper is div divided into five parts. One, an overview of most recent historiographical debates, very short. A description, two, the, a description of the progressive restriction of the margins of tolerance toward the Jews in the papal state. Three, an analysis of the way in which the ghetto affected the Roman Jewish leadership. Four, a discussion on the progressive religious and confessional turn that occurred in the Roman Jewish society as an outcome of Catholic proselytism. Five, in the end, I will analyze this phenomena in the light of the new paradigm of connected history. Let's start, of course, with the first point. In recent years, historians have tried to describe more closely the history of Italian Jews in the early modern age, coming to drastically reconsider the very concept of ghetto era, no longer and not just the time of separation and humiliation, but an era of exper experimentation during which innovative ways of cultural, such as Okay. Is the microphone turned on? No, it's only for the camera. It's only for the camera. Okay, I'm trying to, to speak aloud. <laughs> uh, no longer at the not just the time of separation and humiliation, but an era of experimentation during which innovative ways of cultural, social, and economic sharing among Jews, Christian, and even Muslim were developed in spite of the restriction imposed by the law and a fundamental mutual distrust, as Professor Caffiero just showed. Moving from various perspectives <coughs> and researching different topics, different scholars saw to explaining the events of modernity by reconstructing the elements of an, uh, an uninterrupted but strange dialogue between different groups. At the same time, the perspective of connected history is <coughs> an equally compelling model when applied to a different element, for instance, institutional life, which has so far remained in the background of research. The ability of the Jews to lead with a steady hand the Jewish community was one of the most important traits of this period. Jews were able to stay united and defend their otherness in spite of a broad variety of internal conflicts. The Jewish society was fragmented and conflicted, was socially <coughs> and culturally diverse. Internal conflict often found a solution only by the intervention of Christian courts. The starting point of my research was the divergence between the thesis of the inevitability of the process of cultural contamination, the evidence of strong internal conflict, the disproportionate number of baptism, and the survival of Italian Juda Judaism with its vibrant culture and its strong and independent ident identity during three centuries of fighting evangelization. Humiliated, ridiculed, impoverished, and litigious, the Jews built an organization capable to lead and manage this minority throughout the times. To speak of institutions means to speak of the ruling class. My work traces mechanism and structure of Jewish self-government and draws the profile of those who were selected to lead the hem. From this point of view, the case of Roma is especially relevant. Rome was the first community to adopt an organic statute. And this statute the statue was later used as a model by other communities and remained unchanged until the 19th century. Moreover, Rome was the only <coughs> one community to, subject to direct and local control of the search, as well as to the harshest discrimination in counter-reformation Italy. As, as it is well known, Ancona is a very different situation. The other Italian Jewish, the other Jewish community inside the papal state with Avignone. 
let's start with the second point, the intolerance <coughs> toward Jews in the first half of the 16th century. My reflection begins with a simple observation. Roman Jews did not react to the institution of the ghetto. And despite the radical change ordered by the Pope, Paul IV Carafa, they chose not to enforce any administrative reorganization. There were no other pro no, no protests, no pub and no public fasting, and no tears, as it is had happened for the burning of the Talmud in 1553, just two years before. No one undertook a revision of the statute, the famous Capitoli, in use since 1524, in order to adapt it to new situation and incorporate, for example, a section about the rules to be followed in case of conflict on housing. It should be noted that in Ancona, the reaction was entirely different. On February 1556, the chapter on housing law were already issued and immediately approved by the local governor. The Roman reaction is even more startling if compared with the immediate reaction in the aftermath of the burning of the Talmud, when, in a matter of days, the leaders of all the Italian communities met in Ferrara to discuss a situation of danger. This national conference issued a series of norms deciding that from that point onward, not boot could be printed in Italy without prior approval of a rabbinical committee. In 1554, the decision to adopt self-censorship was an important step towards defining internal rules, thanks to which the Jews confronting the paramount offensive of the church against them and their culture. In the Congress of Ferrara, less than a year earlier, earlier, the Italian Jews said that they would not accept passively the confiscation and condemnation of their fundamental texts. Within the means available to them, they added, they would try to defend their books with the action of generalized and united protection. The 1554 call for unity in the face of a common threat, however, only a few months later, did not resonate. Therefore, the establishment of the ghetto was accepted without much resistance, and the birth of the ghetto in Rome did not cause either adaptation or innovation in the communal statute. It was thanks to its flexible tools, to the arbitration and the appointment of the most important managers that the community was strengthened on the basis of shared rules and reinforced by the personal prestige of the people who were appointed to oversee them. I'm on the third point about the ruling class. The ability to select the ruling class represents one of the most interesting and the less investigated aspects of this history, within which the Roman cases proves to be a model and as such deserves to be considered. Thruff the study of the professions and skills of the members of the ruling class, which were not limited to money lending, it is possible to highlight like the signs of the profound transformation that begins in 1555. In 1524, the statute sanctioned the privileged position of bankers within the Roman Jewish society. As demonstrated by an in-depth analysis of the communal leaders' profiles, few years before the establishment of the ghetto, this process was already completed. The intervention of the Pope in 1554 accelerated the process of centralization and redefinition that, thrust the restriction imposed by his anti-Jewish policy, resulted in an unexpected scenario. The institution of the ghetto did not challenge the preeminence of the bankers. Their perfection, in fact, was one of the few that remained unscathed by the restriction imposed by the Pope. Although nobody formally <coughs> reformed the statute, a new practice contributed to change its feature and functions. During the 50 years following Pope Carafa Bulls, the no most important public positions were often entrusted to the rabbis and no longer only to prominent pony lenders. The appointment of rabbis meant that the ruling on disputes concerning houses, taxes, goods and boundaries of the synagogues was entrusted to individuals who were able to resolve them with the authority of the halakha, the Jewish law. The appointed rabbis, however, were also members of the same small group of families involved with money lending, national and international trading, 
who led the community as usual even in such hard time. In Rome, the rise of rabbis to key position of community governance was an innovation of the ghetto era. In the previous time, rabbis were not considered with either sharing of taxes among the members of a community or outsourcing tax collection. Before the ghetto era, Roman rabbis had been only occasionally called upon to determine what was right and what was wrong according to the Jewish law. Since the previous years, however, in this after the burning of the Talmud, times had changed. Rabbinical knowledge acquired new significance for the doubtful and fearful Jews. Since it was forbidden to access the full version of the halakhic test, rabbis became increasingly essential to teaching, to the apprehension of precepts, discussion, commentary and, exe and exegesis, as well as in the decision make, making based of the complex analysis of, of the oral law. In the end, because in Judaism the written text had become an essential part of the oral transmission of knowledge, the choice of self-censorship of 1554 represented the best solution to protect cultural and religious identity. The preservation and implementation of both Alachic heritage and rabbinic exegesis were pursued by different means. On one hand, through granting formal authorization to the printing of books. On the other, through the authority of the masters and through the old and very reliable mnemonic systems of education from generation to generation, as Jewish tradition demanded. I'll talk at this stage of research, we do not have studies on the contemporary Jewish perception of the new reality of the ghetto. And there is not sufficient comparative data from other communities. My systematic examination of the Jewish notary records of Rome registered the increased prestige of the rabbis in both qualitative and quantitative terms. Many were the rabbis involved in a full range of communal matters, from the resolution of legal actions to governance responsibilities, with the numbers and tasks far greater than those recorded in the years immediately prior the establishment of the ghetto. According to this interpretation, in the Roman ghetto, the rabbinical response to anti-Judaism and to the issues raised by the Reformation and by the Council of Trent inscribed the history of this marginal group within a general trend that, in different form and with different instruments throughout Europe, affected many Christian confession and states. This trend has registered in a specific place and time the Jewish community in Rome during the Counter-Reformation once again signals the ongoing communication between Jews and Christians. This communication produced opportunities of exchanges in various files, despite the erection of physical and cultural barriers recognized by both parties. Those, those connections were not limited to mere economic subsistence, but invested every field of daily life, from cultural exchange to the tools <laughs> of governance. It is important to underline that physical separation did not succeed in excluding Jews from the course <coughs> of history. Through the appropriation and transfiguration of cultural paradigms in acceptable form, even in segregated ghettos and following their own models, the Jews underwent a process of integration into the general society and as such should be studied instead of being forced into a retrospective historiographical ghetto. In order not to fall into the temptation of a baptism, the Jews decided to rely on the most robust and secure leaders they knew, the rabbis. In the same years in which the Church of Rome looked at the rancors of pastors charged with protecting the flock of Christ and struggled to defend the souls of believers from dangerous influences, the Jewish world also sought to strengthen its best minds and institutions that were so deeply attacked in name of this Christian crusade of purification. The decision to call upon the rabbis and other notables to oversee the most critical communal issues could be read from different perspectives, but cannot elude a comparative evaluation. And this is my last point. On one hand, the confessionalization of the Roman Jewish society can be read as a symptom of the inevitable acculturation of Jews to the surrounding world, which was undergoing a similar process. Within this perspective, Jews lost some key elements of their culture regardless of their success in remaining Jews. 
and physically alive. The decline of the study of the Hebrew language and the Alakic text was the main consequence of the censorship of the Talmud since the mid 16th <coughs> century. On the other hand, and in my view more plausibly, the same phenomena can be regarded as one more variation of the traditional Italian Jewish ability to remain part of the surrounding history, in spite of all too often adverse conditions. In this case, too, mm -hmm. Italian Jews reworked the, the solicitation of the mainstream Christian society and, and transformed them in a Jewish way. This phenomenon of religious discipline was not a case of acculturation. It was a result of segregation and was developed through continuous connection with the general society, its problem and its solution. The result was not the creation of a sanctificated and separated Jewish space governed by its own rules. A complex society lived in the ghetto of Rome, and its most relevant feature, feature was to be under attack by very erosive forces. In spite of this, and in line with the trends of the time, in response to calling coming from outside, the Jews choose to put their cultural survival, survival in the hand of the rabbis, trusting the effectiveness of the Jewish law. It should be remembered that those rabbis as well as teachers and scholars were merchants, jewelers, antique dealers, and bankers, engaged in business and well connected with the facts of everyday life and the Christian counterparts. For this reason, the rabbis merchant managed to keep the balance of the group in its Jewish otherness without permanently remove it from the world and its histories. Thank you very much. Um, how do we want to do with language? We're going to help with, uh, I think Stefano Albertini, myself, and Alessandro Cassini are going to help with translation. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll begin from this side and go around. Okay, well, um, very fascinating, many questions. First would be, why do you think, um, how recent has this um, development of it's a, a new vigor and a new focus in um, scholarship in, in these topics? Um, when did that begin? Is it possible to say? The last decade, more than that? And then what do you think has spurred this or catalyzed this, uh, this uh, new focus and vigor? We are Who is yeah. the question for? Who's the sorry. question for? Oh, okay. Both. Both. <coughs> eh, la prima posso parlare in italiano? Sì, la prima cosa che bisogna dire è che fino adesso, fino a poco tempo fa, 10-15 anni fa, eh, la storia degli ebrei è sempre stata un campo separato dalla storia generale. First of all, we have to say that uh, up until 10, 15 years ago, the history of the Jews has always been a separate field from history in general. Nel mio libro, nell'introduzione del mio libro, spiego bene questa cosa, e cioè che eh, gli ebrei facevano storia degli ebrei. I cristiani, chiamiamolo così, dei, i gentili fanno storia generale. Ma la storia generale non incontrava quasi mai la storia degli ebrei. In the introduction to my book, I explain very clearly that Jews used to study the history of the Jews and Christians or Goyim did the Gentile history. But it seemed that general. the two general, but it seemed that the two never crossed. Um, allora, um, l'idea um, è stata quella di far vedere come fosse impossibile che una comunità non enorme, ma molto importante, soprattutto quella romana che è il centro delle comunità italiane e che stava a Roma e che dialogava con il Papa, il capo della cristianità, non poteva essere separata, doveva avere delle relazioni. So first of all we had to, to show that it was impossible to conceive that uh, a Jewish community, especially the Jewish community in Rome, that was in constant contact with the head of Christianity, the Pope, uh, 
could be completely separated and not having a series of different relationship with uh, the papers itself. E mh, questo significava che gli ebrei eh, avevano una grande conoscenza delle leggi cristiane, delle norme, the rules of Christian rules and the decree, decrees uh, uh, del Papa, i decreti del Papa, the de, de law, de, de de laws law. or canon laws. Eh? And, e sapevano usarle così come sapevano usare i tribunali. Noi abbiamo uh, una contraddizione, un paradosso molto interessante che spesso gli ebrei si dirigevano al tribunale dell'inquisizione per avere giustizia perché il tribunale dell'inquisizione era il capo di tutti i tribunali so the, the Roman Jews for example had a perfect knowledge of Christian laws of canon law and uh, to the extent you know they knew very well how to work the courthouse they knew how to go around these rules and uh, uh, there is even a paradox that very often Jews would go directly to the tribunal of the Inquisition uh, that was an ecclesiastical tribunal but it was the supreme tribunal so that was the definitive answer so they would access directly the uh, tribunal of the Inquisition anche perché il tribunale per cause tra di loro scusa sì beh no no quelle le risolvevano a meno che non fossero cause molto importanti per esempio cause matrimoniali I'm, I've asked whether even in uh, litigations within divorzi, the Jewish community divorzi. and she said that normally no they would resolve it inside the community unless they were of extraordinary importance especially things related to marriage law annulments and divorce quindi qui abbiamo il primo mh, problema, il primo punto eh, che riguarda il fatto che eh, la giurisdizione, quindi il, il, il controllo giuridico degli ebrei è dell'inquisizione e questo è un punto interrogativo molto grosso perché l'inquisizione non è un tribunale eh, normale, è il tribunale della fede contro gli eretici e gli ebrei non sono eretici. So we have a first uh, big question mark. How come that the tribunal of the Inquisition is the tribunal in charge of the Jews? Uh, it is uh, the Inquisition, as it is well known, it is formally the, um, the court system that has to supervise the orthodoxy of the Catholic faith against heresy. And Jews are not heretics. They're not heretics within Christianity. So there is a, a question mark and a paradox. The first question mark. First. Eh, il secondo punto importante è che eh, avere trascurato la presenza e il ruolo di una comunità ebraica non così grande però importante ehm, ha determinato per la storia generale mh, una prospettiva troppo chiusa. E io qui nel libro faccio l'esempio della magia e, e della stregoneria, cioè a, e, in Italia ma anche in Europa si è molto studiato la magia e la stregoneria ma non si è mai posto il problema della relazione con le stesse pratiche che facevano gli ebrei e che influenzavano la magia. Questo significa che l'interpretazione generale della magia manca di un pezzo. Um, the second point is that this lack of interaction between general history, in quotation mark, and Jewish history uh, creates a sort of uh, vulnus of, of, of lacuna in general history that is very important um, because the Jewish community is not huge from a numeric point of view but is very, very important from a cultural and social point of view. And in the introduction to her book, um, she explains, for example, uh, the question of magic. There are lots of general books about magic and witchcraft that completely ignored the Jewish contribution to magic and witchcraft. And therefore you really don't have a clear uh, understanding of the phenomenon if you ignore that there was also a form of Jewish magic witchcraft that influenced the Christian world. I, 
eh, finisco sì. quindi la cosa eh, interessante che mi sembrava interessante il secondo punto interessante era eh, di connettere le due storie proprio connettere le due storie per far capire che i più generali processi di trasformazione della società non solo per la stragoneria per esempio per i processi di eh, modernizzazione lettura dei libri eh, rapporti fra uomo e gender <coughs> relationship eh, passano anche attraverso questi scambi dunque due storie che devono dialogare so the final point is that these two histories the general history and the Jewish history have to enter into a dialogue because there are so many fields in which they are interconnected. Magic was only one example, but for example, uh, gender relationships, uh, uh, and, the books, and, and the exchange of books and the fruition of books and how people relate to books. Uh, you, you cannot study that from a general point of view, ignoring what was happening in the Jewish community. I'm going to, uh, excuse me, uh, I want to ask Serena Di Nepi if she wants to add something. Yeah. Just, just one thing. It's in, I try to speak English. I hope my English <laughs> <laughs> could help me. Uh, I think it's important to underline that this process of continuous connections <coughs> between Christians and Jews and or among Christian Jews and Muslims did not produce a loss of cultural, of Jewish culture. The, Jew, the Italian Jews were proudly Jews. They knew Hebrew, they used his they used they mm. used continuous their languages and their culture, even in this situation. And the extraordinary is this they they were able to stay inside the big processes, inside the history without losing our Jewish identity and culture. And this is very important mm. to understand why today Italian Jews is very particular. Until today, mm -hmm. Italian Jews is not Ashkenazi, neither Ashkenazi, neither Sephardi, neither Mizrahi, it's Italian. Mm -hmm. And it is possible because they were able mm -hmm. to keep their culture, their Mahazarim. We had a lot of Mahazarim in the Italian Jewish libraries with the no with the no notes with footnotes and commentaries mm -hmm. made during the ghetto era mm -hmm. and it was possible because they knew their culture even if they have sense there, there was censors against their books mm -hmm. even if, if they were in the ghetto time even if they were so connected with the uh, with the external mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. hello um so i'm very much interested in Visual representation. Is the question for both Loud. speakers? Or what? Louder, please. For both. I'm um, sorry. Yes, maybe um, stand up. Stand so up. Yes. Thank you. Um, so I'm a graduate student at Rutgers, and I'm very much interested in visual representations of Kabbalah that were exchanged between Jews and Christians during the Renaissance. Um, and I wanted to know how how available are such texts, visual representations, drawings, trees of life, you know, um, the spherot, how available are original manuscripts for, for this kind of research and what role do they play in your research? Quanto sono disponibili manoscritti e libri con rappresentazioni grafiche di sefirot? Non sono disponibili. Eh, eh, in, nel 1553 eh, ci fu un grandioso avvenimento a Roma, di cui molto si è parlato, che è, è stato il rogo pubblico del Talmud. Eh, there isn't really much availability of them. In 1553 uh, there was this very famous episode of this bonfire of the Talmud. <coughs> allora, ehm, questo ha significato una condanna, ehm, la condanna è stata emessa dall'inquisizione e una requisizione generale dei libri talmudici e cabalistici che sono espressamente vietati, sono nell'indice dei libri proibiti. So from this moment on, 1553, with the bonfire of the Talmud, uh, this trigger a general order of requisition coming from the tribunal of the Supreme Inquisition uh, of 
all Kabbalistic and Talmudic books, all of them. Ma questo non significa che siano spariti, perché ovviamente eh, gli ebrei li tenevano, li nascondevano, quindi sono arrivati anche fino a noi nelle biblioteche sì, ebraiche di Roma si trovano, ma erano libri eh, anche proibiti o autocensurati, quindi rimangono. Eh, però eh, la cosa importante è che dal punto di vista eh, dei cristiani non, non, non devono essere letti, non, non sono proibiti. Questo rompe con la tradizione umanistica. So this does not mean that this order of requisition of all the Talmudic and Kabbalistic books does not mean that they disappear. Of course the Jews keep them, hide them and keep them in the community. Uh, but the order basically meant that they were taken away from the interchange with uh, the Christian community at large, uh, contrary to what happened during humanism, where there was a great deal of circulation between Uh, between the two, and the humanists were very fond of Kabbalistic culture. If I may add a footnote, with the Centro Primo Levi, we had here an exhibit oh. of Kabbalistic manuscripts at uh. Kinabula from the uh, Public Library of Mantua. It's, it's the biggest and richest uh, collection of Kabbalistic books outside of Israel, and they're in the public library, but they belong to the Mantua Jewish community. Uh, and they've been studied by Professor Buzi, who teaches ah, at the certo. Freistadt University of Berlin. Berlino, okay. So you, you would find under Professor Buzi that there is catalog, a catalog. All of them. Catalog you must have a copy yeah. of in the library. Uh, right? yeah. And they have we beautiful have a copy at the Sefirot and beautiful the visual representations. And naturally, rimangono nelle biblioteche <coughs> vaticane. vaticane. Eh, perché Vatican libri non vengono distrutti, vengono mantenuti. Of, uh, mm -hmm. of There is a big uh, catalog edited by Amedeo Spagnoletto about the ancient uh, books uh, that now are in the, uh, the Union of Italian Jewish Communities li Library. You can. Through the yeah, website yeah. of Centro Primo Levi you can access the catalogs of most libraries uh, in Italy, Israel and the United States that own <coughs> significant collections of it, books of Italian Jewish interest. Uh, and one of the, I think one of the most important here in New York <coughs> is the library at JTS. Yeah. Here's the back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I would like to ask the sources, how you were able, for instance, when <coughs> you mentioned in your wonderful lecture uh, about the um, relationship between the Jewish okay. community and the, uh, the Goy community and the, the exchange of the books. And also the, uh, the fact that the church, especially I mean, the, 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 the Catholic Church, condemned some witchcraft books. I would like to ask if the uh, Jew really wrote witchcraft books or is an interpretation. Okay, that's okay, okay, okay. It's an interpretation. And I would like to, you to underline this thing. So the sources and the misinterpretation of the uh, Catholic Church towards the Zohar, Sefer, Yetzirah, and all the, uh, the books that has nothing to do with sorcery, but they were perceived. Yes. So if you can... Um. Ci sono due livelli, eh, il livello colto e il livello popolare. Eh, dal punto di vista del livello colto, lei ha assolutamente ragione, è una cattiva interpretazione. So first of all, there are two different levels. There is a high level and a popular level. Uh, from the point of view of the high level, uh, you're totally right. It's a question of misinterpretation. E questo si vede, eh, io ho lavorato sulle fonti degli archivi vaticani e in particolare sulle fonti dell'inquisizione, perché l'archivio dell'inquisizione è un archivio enorme per quanto riguarda la, la storia degli ebrei. E c'è tutta la parte sui libri proibiti, 
Sí. Professor Cafiero worked vale. in particular on the uh, Vatican archive uh, that has an enormous collection on the archive uh, of the Inquisition that has an enormous collection no. of prohibited books. Mm -hmm. eh, et, eh, si trova anche un indice manoscritto, non è mai stato pubblicato, indice, non lo so come si dice, un indice, index. Index, index, index of banished books, eh, e eh, ci sono i commenti dei supervisori. I supervisori, sensors, eh, i sensors, eh, erano convertiti. Are the converted. So the, there is even an, in, is a manuscript <coughs> index of all these books in the uh, archive of the Inquisition in the Vatican Library, and that's the, the main source. And this index has never been published, and next to the title of the books there are the comments of the supervisors. The supervisors were convert Jews. A convert Jews very early was were very dangerous. E loro uh, insistevano sull'interpretazione superstizione eh, magia uh, cabalistico nel senso peggiore condanna, di condanna tanto che ci sono degli appunti di inquisitori che dicono non, dibbia, non dobbiamo fidarci fino in fondo uh, dei convertiti i convertiti erano adoperati perché sapevano ebraico um, those converts were, were, were a real danger and their comments really emphasized a lot the aspect of superstition, magic, uh, witchcraft and so on. So much so that the inquisitors at a certain point write that they should handle these comments with caution uh, because of the uh, extremism in the interpretation yes. provided by the converts that of course were used because they knew the language. And the exchange of the book between the, the Jewish community and the Goy community, what kind of books that they used to? No, uh, I, no, ho fatto un esempio, un esempio di un libro uh, che è stato prestato da un ebreo a un cristiano. Poi il cristiano va a denunciare e, e si vede, se in pratica sì, e si vede secondo gli inquisitori... Eh, e che, che libro era? Di che era di magia. Perché a livello popolare anche gli ebrei usavano fare queste cose. Allora una cosa che mi ha molto colpito è nella biografia di Leone da Modena. Io no, no, Leone da Modena è un famoso rabbino. Se non mi perdo. Sì, scusa. We talked about the high level. Uh, it was mostly misinterpretation. At the popular level, there were Jewish books about magic, as there were Christian books about magic. And the example Professor Kafir provides in the book is one of these books about magic that was lended by a, a Jew to a Christian who asked for it, that then went to the Inquisition to report him for having given him uh, these books. And uh, now we are talking about Leone da Modena. Yes, uh, un esempio interessante dei due livelli è eh, Leone da Modena. Leone da Modena era un importantissimo rabbino che aveva relazioni strettissime col mondo umanistico e colto, eh, e non in solo italiano, europeo, era di Venezia. E ha scritto vari libri eh, dedicati tra l'altro a principi cristiani e uno di questi libri si, intitolava, si intitola I riti degli ebrei dove lui vuole dimostrare l'assoluta razionalità, tranquillità, sono consuetudini, abitudini, niente superstizione, niente abuleti, niente credenze, nulla. So one great example of this intersection of the high and the low is Leone da Modena, who was a great humanist, who had uh, intellectual contacts and exchanges not only uh, with Italian but with European humanists, uh, who is a very prolific writer and dedicated uh, many of his books uh, to Christian princes. And one of these books is The Rituals of the Jews. And it's a book in which he explains uh, Jewish liturgy in a very plain, rational, simple way, trying to uh, present it as a perfectly normal, rational, yes. 
uh, series of uh, uh, costumes and, uh, uh, and rites. Molto simili a quelli dei cristiani. Very similar Siamo to the ones of Christians. A metà seicento. We're in the middle of the 17th century. Yes. But uh, uh, quando noi andiamo a leggere il diario, uh, the diary, intimate, intimate day, <laughs> is no. a tutta un'altra questione, tutto un altro mondo fabbricava amuleti, li vendeva ai cristiani, li faceva fare tutto so, when you read the book, the rituals of the Jews by Leone da Modena this perfect, rational, uh, very um, simple explanation of the rituals uh, there is no mention of magic, amulets, uh, talismans and so on and then when you read his personal diary, his journal uh, there is all sorts of things of this sort, including production of amulets that were also sold to Christians, uh, <laughs> magic uh, recipes and other things of that sort. Because astrological, uh, astrological, astrological charts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the, in, in, within the same person, this yes. great humanist, you have the two levels. They were not necessarily different people, but in the same person there was a coexistence of, of the high and the low. Okay. Okay. Yes. Um, okay, my question is, um, I was under the impression that once we were on that Venice was the first ghetto, and secondly, how different was it in the Venetian ghetto since they were a lot more independent because they were um, economically very independent, they made a boat a day, and you know, the, the, uh, the trade back and forth and so on, were they as uh, controlled by, by the Pope as, say, Rome was. Rome was obviously Serena, the Venice is a very different situation. Yeah. It was uh, established in 1516, but it was a way to, c to let the Jews live uh, as Jews in Venice, because before the 1516, they never were admitted in Venice. They <coughs> were in Venice, but they were not official and not, not legal. Okay. So, in Venice, 1516 means that now the Jews can st could stay in Venice, legal and open. It was different because Venice is another state, but it's important to underline that in Venice, as uh, later in Livorno, who is another in particular sea town in Italy, Livorno is the town without ghetto, the Roman Inquisition tried every time to uh, Establish a way to control the Jews even in this different situation. But in this situation, the state, the independent state, made an interposition between uh, the protection between Jews and the Pope. So they weren't <coughs> under the, the hand. Yes, of they're the not Pope because they, they, you, you know it's, po it, it's polit different states. Right. And when was the ghetto established? 1516. 1516. It was the first, yeah. it was the first yeah. but it was a different anniversary. It's coming up. Ah. It, <coughs> Could you clarify for me? I understand <coughs> that you said that the literature about the history of magic, right, does not acknowledge the contributions of the Jews. And when are you talking about? And currently, is there new literature about the history of magic that acknowledges the contribution of the Jews currently? <laughs> Well, I think that uh, I think that is an interesting. Um, I think that in the, maybe it's something needs to be clarified. That there has been uh, there, has, there has been a trend of uh, um, scholars. <coughs> on uh, these issues and of course uh, different scholars approach uh, the, the topic in different ways and from different perspectives. So we have here Edward Goldberg uh, who is, uh, is the author of Jews and Magic, um, an example of uh, uh, exactly, is, is the gentleman here? And, and perhaps, I don't know if Serena, you want to give, just to clarify what the, the, you know, the main scholars who have uh, um, worked in the... No, in I, I think... W would I be helpful. So yes, that we, we can make some names. It's time to make names. a little names. bit so this, this, uh, this uh, question of new and old. Uh, the most uh, names that are available in English, of course, 
uh, of course we are thinking about Ruder, David Ruderman and its works, um, about Robert Bonfil and its works. There's a very different perspective between Absolutely. them. Absolutely different, but in... There is an ongoing, it's an ongoing yeah, but conversation. But, yeah, but there is a question that they posing with the Bernard, Coomer, Bernard Cooperman or in economic history, Francesca Trivellato, oh, yes. just, mm -hmm. just at the moment. Or in Italian, but I don't know if it is, po it is available in English, Luciano Allegra, Giacomo Tedeschini and Marina Caffiera, Francesca Bregoli is sitting there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, uh, yes, there are a lot of scholars. Yes, a lot of them are at the moment in this room. And they are er everyone from different perspectives. Someone is more interested in cultural history. Someone other is more interested in economic history. Some I'm interested in institutional history. Everyone is thinking about how it, how it works. It's if we if we go to the archive, the sources say to us that there is there are connections. The question is how they works, Be because we know that on the top level, the, the law says said that Jews must be uh, <coughs> completely separate. Completely then we go to the archives and we know that they are not completely separate, but how it, 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 it was possible, mm -hmm. so how it, how it, it works. This right, is I the would question. say that just to, to yes. clarify this, this issue, I mean, uh, in, uh, in the United States, the books of uh, Kenneth Stowe on the ghetto of Rome have been available for many decades now. And uh, I think the fascination with this history of um, presumed complete segregation, but instead uh, that we, we see is uh, took many forms of exchange and integration, has been approached at different times uh, from the different perspectives. And, and the issue of uh, main uh, uh, historiography and Jewish historiography is certainly exists. I mean, in a depart in uh, American departments or even Italian departments, but here in the sta states, departments of Italian studies usually don't teach Jewish history. The Jews are generally excluded <laughs> by curricula uh, of high school, of uh, colleges, of universities. Mm? Well, it's uh, in the department of Italian studies. <laughs> are do you? Uh, Italian studies usually they're very, very, very. The absolutely, it's a, it's a different issue. It's a different. I didn't say that Jewish history or Italian, and even there is a is a very you know small part. But in general, in Italian departments, uh, except for some uh, 20th century literature, there is very little attention dedicated to the Jewish history. But you have a in uh, university, yeah. Italian university too are not uh, mm -hmm. center. Uh, no, the, it, it exists. Is, is it exists? It's a differ. It's a difficult process mm -hmm. of yes. dialogue and yeah. integration. I think that um, general statements uh, on these things yeah. are difficult to make, but it yeah. is a difficult no, uh, uh, process. I received. I don't know. Yes, it's uh -huh. it's a very it's a difficult yeah. process of uh, of uh, how do how do we create how, how do do we create retrospectively an image of uh, a common history and that's how different I mean there are different historians different scholars diff different trends uh, approaching this uh, from different perspectives and that's I think just uh, sorry for the interruption. Yes, the, uh, the books that were banned in fifteen fifties onward. Uh, were retained uh, by the Vatican. Uh, these were dangerous books. What was the what were the reasons, the motivations of the Vatican to retain these books that were understood to be dangerous to society? Retain instead of rather destroy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 uh, I libri erano sequestrati già da prima del Cinquecento. Parliamo del Cinquecento perché è l'inizio della Early Modern Era. Eh, venivano sequestrati ma non distrutti eh, perché c'è in fondo l'idea dell'importanza della cultura ebraica e della necessità di leggere e conoscere per convertire. 
il principale eh, scopo eh, della politica nei confronti degli ebrei è la conversione quindi è, è un'ossessione proprio una obsession of uh, conversion It, we have to say that uh, books were banned also yeah. before Uh, 1500. We use 1500 as a conventional date as the beginning of the modern era. They were banned before. The reason why uh, they were not destroyed or kept and studied is on one hand that there was an interest and there was an understanding of the importance of Jewish culture. And the second thing is that this obsession to convert the Jews uh, led the, the Catholic authorities to understand where they came from. They knew that in order to convert them, they had to know exactly what yes. they believed in, and the system of beliefs was contained important in these part. books. And therefore, these books were important to be studied in order yeah. to um, strategize a, a, a plan of conversion. A Roma c'è una scuola di ebraistica molto importante, molto grossa e importante. Bisogna studiare i testi ebraici per rispondere. E la cosa interessante, e questo è ad alto livello, a livello più basso, il sabato gli ebrei erano costretti ad andare a sentire eh, forse il preaching, la, la predica forzata, che si svolgeva sulla liturgia fatta quel giorno di sabato nella sinagoga. Quindi era una risposta. Eh, è considerato molto importante sapere che cosa gli ebrei scrivono poi c'è anche un interesse di tipo culturale più ampio in pochi personaggi so when again there is the high and the low on the high there was a, a strong interest there was a, a school of Jewish studies in Rome that was very very important uh, from an intellectual and scholarly point of view uh, let's say on the popular level uh, Roman Jews were forced to go to listen to homilies, forced preaching on the Sabbath, on the Shabbat. Mm -hmm. uh, the interesting thing is that these uh, homilies, these preaching, were based on the Jewish liturgy of that day. So uh, they would go to temple, and then they, when they came out, the priest or the friar in charge of the homily would comment on the readings and the ritual of that day. On the same parasha. <laughs> so that was the, the, the idea that in order to do that, you needed to have access to these books. And that's why you have to. My, my question has to do with uh, the importance of geography and scholarly focus. Now, when you look at Jewish historiography produced in the US, a lot of scholars have focused on Venice. So that at a certain point in the maybe 1980s, 1990s, it looked like all Italian Jewish history could yeah. be reduced to a history of Venice. <laughs> and a lot of the most interesting historiography that is coming out of Italy now focuses on Rome. Yeah. So the question is, which I think goes at the heart of studying Italian history in the early modern era, how representative are any of these communities? Uh, you both have a very Rome-centric <laughs> perspective, but can we apply this perspective to other Italian states that were independent? So this goes to, uh, yeah. to speak to your question about Venice. Um, working on Tuscany, yes. Stephanie has done. Um, we see a different perspective. Working on Mantua, we see a different perspective. So if you can speak a little bit about how can we take the Romano-centric perspective and apply it, or how can we use it to learn more about? I think it's important to remember one thing, that it's real that we have different communities with different history subjected to different state. Every land, Venice is different because Venice is the Republic of Venezia. The Tuscan state is different because it was the Medici state. Piemonte, Piedmont is another different history. Rome is different history, but it's central because in Rome there was the Pope. Yeah. And yeah. even so if there are not. different states, the Pope every time tried mm -hmm. to make other states make the same things they made in Rome. So <coughs> Rome, Rome From the Pope perspective, from the church perspective, Rome is the center, and it, it, it must be the model to which everyone must look. And the, I think that the, the ghetto project and the ghetto strategy, it's so important because it was in Rome. Venice had to be a model. But can I just play the devil's advocate and push the notion that maybe Rome is exceptional, precisely no, because the Pope is there? 
No, posso rispondere io. Ehm, se partiamo dalla questione eccezionale non arriviamo da nessuna parte, perché Venezia è eccezionale, Livorno è eccezionale, ehm, no, Roma è eccezionale. Eh, non è questo il punto, il punto è il metodo, lo, il metodo storiografico, come si studiano queste cose. E, eh, allora, tenendo conto della diversità delle situazioni, eh, era abbastanza strano che Roma fosse così poco studiata e eh, molto strano che lo fosse Venezia invece, questa è, è va rovesciata la prospettiva. Inoltre bisogna tenere... <coughs> Mi fermo. <laughs> uh, the, the question of, of the exceptional case of Rome uh, can be applied also to most of the other Jewish communities in Italy. Each of them is exceptional in one way. Uh, the question that we raise here is a question of method. It's the methodology that we apply to uh, the study of these communities. Um, and there is, it's actually quite uh, interesting and stunning on, on one level, the fact that Rome had not been studied as much as Venice. I find that more paradoxical. Sì, paradoxical. E, e se si vuole eh, qualche modo giustificare l'interesse su Roma è eh, come Serena ricordava, non solo perché è la città dove c'è il Papa che fa i decreti per tutti, ma eh, possono anche non essere applicati questi decreti. Venezia per esempio non li applica. Ma eh, la cosa interessante però è che gli inquisitori locali che avevano diritto eh, di eh, controllare eh, la materia ebraica, mandavano a Roma tutto questo materiale e quindi Roma è il centro di raccolta di tutte le questioni, eh, le, eh, i documenti che io ho visto non riguardano solo Roma, riguardano tutta l'Italia con la necessità di chiedere parere, consiglio, cosa devo fare in questa situazione e Roma decide. So the, the, the fact of course is that the very centralized system of the Catholic Church reflects on the central presence of Rome. Uh, the Pope of course can uh, legislate all over the world. Uh, this doesn't mean that uh, the papal laws or rules are, are enforced in every place. For example, Venice does not accept and enforce uh, the papal decree. But the inquisitors all over the world that are in charge of supervising the Jewish communities report to Rome. They ask for advice, they submit cases, and the uh, documents that Professor Cafiero examined are about the whole world, not, not about Rome. Everything was referred back to Rome, and therefore the, the, this uh, wealth of documents is uh, reflecting that. E già questo sottolinea l'importanza di Roma. Excuse me. We have a question here. Yeah. 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 It must be remembered that when a, 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 a counselor of the Inquisition or, about, or, 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 or another congregation in Rome they took a decision, he was looking to the Roman to the Roman he, he, to, to go to work. He must walk inside the Roman street and see the Roman Jews. Even if he's deciding about Jews in Goa or in India, as it were. First of all, thank you very much. I certainly appreciate and respect your research about the um, influence of the Jewish religion on, and as a, the Jewish religion um, stood in counterpoint to Christianity in Italy. I have an interest, however, in the set more secular influences of not the Jewish religion, but the Jews mm. as they lived in, in not in integrated settings, but as you say, the, the separation between the ghetto and the outside the ghetto was not, not so tight. There was immersions back and forth. <coughs> and the Jewish culture has many, many, many aspects that are not only religious. As we know in Italy, what is more important than food? <laughs> yeah. And there is, we know that the Jews were not using lard. <laughs> and pink fat, lard. And so I'm wondering if what, if anything, in your research, you read and studied 
um, about the more secular influences mm. of the Jewish, the Jewish mm. culture mm. into the Italian culture as they merge or not. For yeah. example, one of the every Jews, day, the Jews harp day. that we in Sicily see so much, that little instrument, bang, 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 That's you know, it makes that crazy time. And it's very much a part of the Sicilian music and it's the Jews harp. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Every day contact, uh, life. Mm -hmm. sì, sì. Um, sì, nel libro ne parlo, uh, soprattutto per uh, le questioni alimentari. Ed è molto interessante perché mm, è chiaro che i cristiani riconoscevano immediatamente gli ebrei. Cioè, per esempio, in una taverna... In una taverna, eh, se capitavano degli ebrei, c'è cioè proprio un caso che ho descritto, eh, allora li riconoscevano perché non mangiavano maiale o non mangiavano nello stesso piatto, erano immediatamente riconosciuti. Questo però no, non significa che ci fossero imitazioni, però è anche, cioè, che i cristiani imitassero alcuni comportamenti quotidiani alimentari degli ebrei. Però, per esempio, eh, durante Purim, gli ebrei e i cristiani, nonostante i divieti, entravano in ghetto e partecipavano alle feste. Ok, basically what she's saying that in, in, the, in her book, she talks, of, she talks, she gives louder, examples, louder. in the book she gives examples precisely of this issue, I mean of a secular influence between the Jewish culture and the Christian culture, and particularly regarding food and diet and restrictions. So what she's saying is that it was very clear to Christians that Jews were following uh, dietary laws that set them apart. So the Jews in that respect were very recognizable. The example that she gives is a tavern, a restaurant where Jews would go and they would not eat pork and they would use different plates for uh, dairy, etc. What she's saying is that uh, though this made them recognizable, it does not imply that the, that the Christians imitate this behavior to any extent. Um, Però, and then uh, the other uh, example, which is very interesting, is during the uh, Purim festivity, though it was, it was prohibited for Christians to enter the ghetto, <gasps> there were Christians who would enter the ghetto to participate in the festivity. They liked home and tash. <laughs> Hold on one second. We have we have three questions here. Okay. Uh, Professor Goldberg, and, yeah, and then, then we have Yehud, and then. Uh, in regard to intellectual perspectives and more concretely research strategies. More voice, please. Uh, in regard to intellectual perspectives and more concretely uh, research strategies, I think Marina made a very important observation, which Serena I think substantiated as well particularly in regard to the crucial and extremely difficult problem of the permeability of the ghetto. Uh, Marina, you said that there was more integration of Jews into the general society than we would imagine from the rules and regulations and laws. I think this is an extremely important uh, point of research strategy. And I think it's a big problem that is now being overcome. I think until very recently, the jumping off point for understanding the Jewish situation was the laws, mm -hmm. which I think was, was, well, look, we're talking about Italy, where laws are absolutely <laughs> important and don't matter at all. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> if you want to try. <laughs> Uh, I think uh, a real problem has been that the history of the Jews in Italy has tended to be written on the basis of what were the laws and restrictions, mm -hmm. not what were the exceptions. Yeah, right. What were the exceptions? If we read the laws, Jews couldn't do anything ever, and we know that's not the case. And that we're dealing in Italy with a series of more or less absolute states that ran on the basis of grace and favor and special permissions, where tutto era trattabile, in effect, 
where everything sí, could be negotiated. And um, I think it's much more important that when we go to the archive, as, as, as I think you said, Selena, uh, when we go to the archive, we see all, okay, some mentioned the archive, we see incredible involvement of Jews. A lot was permitted. There were so many special permissions. And I think that most of the laws in most places in Italy, were, I'm just guessing, were, I work on Florence, but my, my sense is that a law was just drawing a line and saying, now we can talk about what you can really do. Mm -hmm. You go to the, you know, the princes, you go to your contacts with the administration, and then you do your deal. And I think that many Jews had their own special relationships to the powers. Yes. So I think the emerging uh, new historiography is being based and needs to be based much more on mm -hmm. the exceptions rather than on the exactly. laws. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think. No, no I, I think that the question is this one at the moment. <coughs> Starting from our research and from the research that, that scholars now are, work, are making in Italy about Italian history, we have the law. And the law says, says something. Then we have the archives, and the archives putting, uh, are putting in light how important is the individual. We have an individual level and a social level. The question is how it, they are interacting. How, how, how important is the individual in a, com a, a general society and a general idea of mis mutual distrust? <laughs> Io volevo aggiungere piccolissima, brevissima cosa che eh, ringraziando Edward per questa osservazione giustissima che lui stesso nel suo lavoro su Blanis e le sue lettere dimostra il ruolo che gli ebrei hanno di mediatori culturali molto forte. Io ho curato eh, un numero monografico di rivista sulla censura, come aggirare la censura. Eh, non so come si dice aggirare, come aggirare la censura e gli ebrei sono uno dei modi con cui si aggira la censura per riuscire a procurarsi libri proibiti i medici eh, si, si rivolgono all'ebreo Blanis per avere libri proibiti I'd like to thank you for your comment and she agrees completely with this very important point yes. she's uh, basically she one, one, one of the aspects of her research that came out in a, uh, in a journal recently is exactly this idea of how Jews were used to get around law. So actually, you know, papal and uh, local princes would make laws and then the Jews would find ways to get around them. And so often, the Jews were the brokers of those who wanted to get around. And the example of Medici Florence is a very good one where the Medici knew that the Jews had the expertise to do exactly this getting around the rules. So this is a very important point for the reasons that you indicate, but more in general, uh, <coughs> as a characteristic of the Jews as seen by the Christians as me mediators in this world. Okay. Uh, when speaking about the influence of um, burning and censorship on Jewish culture, uh, Italian books have been exported, to, Hebrew books printed in Italy had been exported all over Europe, and conversely, books from Poland or at some point in Constantinople and Amsterdam or wherever came in to Italy. So uh, I think it might make sense to look at the, the impact of the withdrawal of Italian books on communities outside <coughs> Italy and not merely on communities inside Italy. In a sense, even if one looks at the whole of Italy, one might be too particularistic, uh, especially when looking at the impact of something like this on Jews. Okay, you must. It, it's important to be remembered that uh, Jewish books were are, are being printed in Italy until one time and not over, not o not later than I suppose 1596, but I'm not sure that this is the last day. Later. Yeah, no, eh, Livorno è un'altra storia. Venice, Mantova, Soncino. Soncino all'inizio, all'inizio. Professor Cattelli, I'd like to say that this really applies to before. But at the time we're talking about very few Jewish books. No, but if you're talking about the impact, if you're talking about the impact of this, then, then it, 
as I say, these Italian books were exported all over Europe. So yes, they, they were. They have been exported. The difference is that you have Jewish printers until one time, mm -hmm. and then later you have Christian printers that are printing Jewish books, but not all Jewish books, <laughs> only some some subjects of Jewish books. But you have in Italy Jewish books coming from all over yeah. the world, yeah. about all over the sub <laughs> of all over the subject. The question is how these books could come inside Italy, even if there is a sense, any index that uh, interdicted them. Did they always come in Italy, even in this time? Yes. We have we have in the Jewish Italian libra, Jewish Italian libraries books coming from all over the world and all over the times. Didn't Livorno have a very big Jewish publishing? Okay, we have all. She is studying Livorno. Okay, we have a question. Yeah, a short comment about the law and then a question for Serena. The law creates a framework, and thanks to that framework, we are then able to find materials in the archive. If there are points that are not related in law, we won't find them in the archives because they are not contested. So in some way, law kind of sh shapes what we can uh, can find in terms of materials for social uh, social history. But I have a question for you, uh, Serena, about the, the rise of the rabbi as the communal leader. Mm -hmm. Because in the early modern period elsewhere, and I don't know um, enough about the other places in Italy, but certainly in Poland, which becomes one of the most and largest and most important Jewish community in the world in the early modern period, uh, even in Germany, you have the rise of the lay leadership. And I'm wondering, I'm sort of thinking in my, in my head is, this is because in other places, lay leaders and lay to become the most important political figures. If <coughs> and this is what other people from studying of Jews at other Italian places can say. If this is true for other Jewish community in Italy, they might not work. But if it's true for Rome, is it again because they are mimicking the leadership? So in Poland, the communal structure really ref reflects, Jewish communal structure reflects the Polish communal structure. Uh, the Va'ad Arba Atzot, the Council of Four Lands, is really like the Polish same, like the Polish parliament. So the mechanisms are very similar. So I'm wondering whether you could tell us more whether Rome is exceptional or whether, in fact, this is an Italian, uh, Italian now, phenomenon. I, I suppose that in Rome, it, it's, it's the same. It reflects what's happening yeah. outside yeah. the Jewish community. Uh, we have, I don't know how to translate it in English, but we have a thesis about the confessionalism, the, the, the words of uh, Prodi, uh, you know them. Uh, it's the same. It must be remembered that the Roman Jewish community was particular about social, socially particular at the end of the uh, 14th century and fifth, at the beginning of the 16th century. But are oh. rabbis leaders in other Italian communities, or is it sort of really uh, something that emerges? As I know, the, the, the Mm, th there aren't research like uh, like me on mm -hmm. other Jewish communities. But I if I'm thinking about the important Jewish mm -hmm. of the other Jewish communities, maybe you can turn to Isacco Lampronti, the mm -hmm. very famous rabbi of Ferrara, who was also leading the community of Ferrara, mm -hmm. or about the important Jewish community of the beginning of the 18th uh, 19th century. Okay. Things about uh, Shadal. They, they were also involved in institutions, not only as mm -hmm. masters. It, I think it would be, it's a great, it's a great question. Yes, it's, it's really one. crucial to understand yes, yes. how communal leadership and communal structures change. And it would be perhaps easy enough to put our heads together and think about those of us that work on various Italian Jewish communities, how, what was the, 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 the makeup yes. of the leaders? Who were the Masai? Were they the exactly. bankers, were they the merchants? Mm -hmm. What does that tell the about? Is that the, those rabbis yeah. were also merchants and... So I can tell yes. in Livorno, Men's the them. rabbis were subjected to the leadership yes. of yes. the lady. Rabbis the and Medici. <coughs> Medici. Uh, in in Livorno, the rabbis come for nothing. Stephanie, what happens in Florence? This, it's only the merchants that... Yeah, yeah, the rabbis are just used, uh -huh. used <laughs> as, uh, as teachers and rabbis. Okay. But mm -hmm. did they... Did they were only rabbis or have some other profession? Well, 
Um, I only follow them through about 1650. <laughs> uh -huh. So it's only the first 70 years of the ghetto. And um, 80 years of the ghetto. And they are, they are, they don't dominate. They don't take over the communal government. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it, but it's, but I wanted to, to mention now that, now that eyes are on me for a second, that um, I, I think that um, Marina called attention to how what's new is method and the use of archives and, and Ed's point is terrific, of course. To Stephanie, can you understand? The reason that we all know so much now is because we read archives and not just laws mm -hmm. and rabbinic documents. That's why we know so much. But also, we are asking new questions. So new methods, new sources, new questions. And I wanted to call attention to a, an interesting dilemma. Um, in your work, Serena, the question which I uh, find um, interesting and most interesting about your paper is how did the Jews respond? And you argued that they responded by supporting and bolstering and using rabbinic authority and the status of the rabbis. That's a wonderful insight and an interesting thing to study. But a lot of the, um, I, I suppose, lay people in the group <coughs> are interested in why do non-Jews not know Italian Jewish studies and why is it not integrated uh, in the general academic enterprise? And that brings us to the rub, which is as Jews become interested in what Jews do, um, which is the creative and the dynamic aspect within the community, this becomes less interesting to the general population. When we study converts or social interaction or the ways in which Jewish culture might influence non-Jewish culture, then non-Jewish studies people are interested in it. And I think both need to continue to be done. Yes, uh, thank you, Stephanie. I think that's a wonderful uh, contribution to the seminar and something that may, may be collectively uh, those of us uh, who, who are involved in research could uh, continue to discuss. Uh, we have a question here. That it's yeah. not a question, but it's just a comment. You, you may know about this incident or rest, but the reason I bring it up is because it ties in with so many aspects that were discussed today the aspect of the role of the rabbi, the aspect of the role of the integration of Jews into Italian society, the aspect of the role of the Inquisition, and the role of the papal states. So this incident happened later. It was in the 1700s, I believe. And it involved the abduction of a young Jewish boy. Does anyone know about it? It was 19th century. So all of these things, all of these things had already happened. And it just, it was, I don't know if you have discussed this or perhaps your study was much earlier than this, but this was the 19th century already and this was still going on. So the abduction of this young boy and of course the Inquisition wouldn't let him go and the Pope wouldn't let him go. And the rabbis were totally ineffectual. And yet they were able to find a way to resolve it only because, yeah. So I mean, I, I, I'm surprised that it wasn't brought up, but this just seems to me to be um, uh, an example of all of these things that were discussed and how they were connected. Yes. Uh, sì, uh, io intanto sarei molto cauta nell'uso della parola integration uh, perché assomiglia troppo a assimilation <ride> quindi uh, noi, uh, non è solo una questione di parole uh, io uso la parola connessione, relazioni, rete, mh, uh, interazione Integrazione è già qualcosa di più sette ottocentesco. Okay, first of all, for the period that she's studying, she's very careful in terminology. She does not like to use the word integration. It's too close to assimilation. What she's talking about is a, is a web of interrelations between these two communities. So integration is a word she does not like to apply to this period that she's studying. E, e rispetto alla questione del caso Mortara, come lei sa, c'è stato un libro di David Kerzer molto importante, è stato tradotto anche in, in italiano. Mm, ma eh, Kerzer si è occupato del, non è l'ultimo, è il penultimo caso di battesimi forzati. 
Melens is not kidnapping. It's not kidnapping. The title. Yes, but it's not kidnapping. It's a forced baptism. After what the the baby is, but is where is Perikera? Where is he? It was considered a Christian baby. But uh, prima di arrivare al caso Mortara c'è tutta una storia lunghissima di battesimi forzati che io ho studiato nel mio libro. Il mio libro è stato tradotto in America, eh, California University Press, eh, eh, Forced Baptism. Okay. Okay. So, <coughs> Professor Caffiero wants to specify, first of all, that this case that you refer to, uh, Gardo Mortara, yeah, yeah, has been, has been, uh, has been amply discussed and written about, most famously by David Kurtzer, but second to last of his book is dedicated. Now, another fine point that she was trying to make, that the title in English, The Kidnapping of Gardo Mortara, according to her, is, you know, not the correct way of looking at it. It was not a kidnapping, but uh, just a forced baptism. I mean, he was a, a baptism was forced because he was considered a Christian child. But uh, more importantly, this case did not come out of the blue. There's a long history of forced baptism, which is actually the subject of a book of hers. And so in her book, she examines really the history, the evolution of this phenomenon leading up to something like uh, the case. The book is translated by the, the California University. Yes, just oh, thank you. Il caso Bortara ha fatto molto scalpore, molto scandalo, perché siamo a metà Ottocento, quando nel resto d'Europa e anche in Italia, tranne che nello Stato Pontificio, c'era stata l'emancipazione politica e giuridica degli ebrei e perché c'era di mezzo un Papa molto controverso come Pio IX. Ma la storia precedente è importante per capire quali sono i fondamenti giuridici, canonici, per i quali si potevano fare queste cose terribili. So she'd like to frame historically why this case became so prominent. And what she's saying is that the story in itself is not so unusual or unprecedented. What's particular about it and the reason why it captured the popular imagination in, in, uh, is that it occurred so late in time. It occurred in a time when the rest of Europe, the rest of Italy, with the exception of the Vatican of Papal State, really had prohibited, had really done with this kind of uh, phenomenon. And so, again, she's saying that in her book, the real contribution is to frame the, the canonical laws, the, the juridical uh, justification for this phenomena in the centuries preceding that. You have a question? Yes. Yeah, you, you mentioned earlier that the Jews uh, were used as negotiators, in a sense, which to me is a very positive role to be a negotiator. And then you said that getting around, they were used to get around, which again, my own interpretation is to me then sort of um, very negative, or it implies cunning. And to me, they're, they're actually very different. And I'm wondering, first of all, what were they getting around if they were supposedly integrated into the community? They were not separated, and I believe it was said earlier that um, the inquisitors did not consider them heretics. What were they getting around so much that they had to become? You understand what I'm asking. <laughs> Quello che è stato detto prima, come positivo, il ruolo degli ebrei come mediatori. Cioè, per lei la parola, il ruolo del mediatore è un ruolo positivo. Quello che invece è un ruolo molto meno positivo, come diverso, che ha risultati, l'idea di get around, di aggirare, usare gli ebrei per aggirare i loro Allora la sua domanda specifica è se gli ebrei non erano esistiti dall'inizio come soggetti, 
Allora, in che senso voi eh, avete detto che i siti usati per aggirare le leggi? Dovrebbe chiedere a tutti. No, per aggirare le leggi. Però forse la domanda più generale, il tono più generale della domanda è che sono parlato di riferimento, il ruolo di mediazione, di ruolo di la capacità di brain, di aggirare le leggi. Diciamo il ruolo di mediatore non deve essere per forza positivo, il mediatore è appunto colui che negozia, che tratta da una parte e dall'altra. Per esempio, sicuramente nel caso dei libri è un ruolo che per noi è positivo, ma siamo noi che lo pensiamo positivo, siamo noi che lo vediamo così, no? Ma certamente le autorità non lo vedono positivo. Io ho trovato un caso di un ebreo processato perché possedeva e traduceva un libro protestante, eretico, quindi lo metteva in giro. So she's, she's saying that she'd be very cautious in assuming that the role of the mediator is a positive one. It's a positive one in our eyes, but in reality, mm -hmm. sometimes applied to the, to the circulation of books, writ now, we could see it as a positive role for the role that it had socially and culturally. In reality, a person who's mediating is a person who finds himself having to deal with two different realities. So in her specific uh, research, she does not see this as a having a positive connotation. So that the cunning aspect is not really the negative, but this is the positive. A specific <coughs> example is that she studied the case of this one Jew who stu stood trial because he was found in, pot in possession of a heretical book. It, it really was a heretical book in the sense that it was a Protestant text that was subject to the uh, uh, Inquisition. Well, we say lawyers. We indicate both cunningness and the ability to negotiate. They really <laughs> go together. Yeah. They're not very cool. good right. as a negotiator. Yeah. Right. They're not cunning. Sorry. Okay, we have a question here and yeah. then. Um, okay. um, I, I loved your, um, your, your four categories. Um, Marina, this is for you. Sorry, this is for Marina. <laughs> and I'm not, uh, I'm not, I don't work on Jewish history. I work on, uh, on, uh, Sub-Saharan African history in the Renaissance in Italy, in particular. So I'm working on another minority, as it were, yes. another minority subject. Of course, that's a ludicrous way to describe anyone. Um, so my my uh, point might be um, that it's not only the Jews who behave like this, who uh, found ways round the law in Italy. Uh, that it's everybody. Um, but it's everybody in that situation. Mm -hmm. So from that, if you look at it from that point of view, this isn't necessarily only a Jewish issue. Um, and mm -hmm. the, the archives are full of traces of these things. That's what's wonderful for us. Uh, for those of us who are archival historians, this is, this is what makes it all worthwhile. Um, and I, I, I think maybe it, this is good in terms of what you were talking about, in terms of uh, whether, in terms of how non-Jewish historians can uh, get interested or stay interested in this, because this is something that's bigger. It's not just, mm -hmm. it's not just something that's applicable, or maybe. Mm -hmm. That's what I'd like to bring up, and perhaps mm -hmm. ask Marina what she means. Can you repeat again, what's your field of study? The good, the good yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I work on uh, sub-Saharan Africans, no. not only slaves, sub-Saharan Africans in Renaissance Italy. We have no competition with the slaves. reason because when we start, when we are, the workshop was on, on Jews, but while we are studying Jews, every time we will meet some other, other minorities. Uh -huh. I think that it's important to underline that Jews were the model. Were the what? Model. 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 Yeah. It's ah. the most important, you know. No, I'm not sure I would agree. Because, <laughs> I know, because, of, because of the history of slavery. Because in my case, the history of slavery is the biggest model. Mm -hmm. 
Ma secondo me ci sono, mh, allora, sono dei tipi di stranieri, foreigners, diversi. Eh, intanto gli ebrei non sono stranieri, perché sono comunità eh, eh, stabili, loca located. Eh, mentre invece eh, muslim eh, vanno, vengono, eh, eh, restano, si convertono oppure scappano. Noi in questo momento come gruppo stiamo studiando appunto eh, eh, questa mobilità degli stranieri, il loro arrivo a Roma, eh, in particolare anche dei musulmani, ma secondo me ehm, anche lì i documenti eh, rivelano una differenza abbastanza forte, le dinamiche sono le stesse, gli stranieri usano le leggi, le conoscono eh, e, e ne approfittano, però ehm, la esiste una gerarchia degli stranieri, esiste una gerarchia degli stranieri così come esiste una gerarchia dei convertiti. Allora, al primo... Ah, scusa. No, siccome lei conosce l'italiano. Sì, no, e lei conosce. Okay, so the fine point that uh, Professor Cafe is trying to make is that she agrees with the observation, but what's important to keep in mind is that there are different levels and actually a hierarchy of foreigners in Italy in, in every time. And specifically, going back to what uh, Serena had said about the Jews being the model, uh, she's saying... Uh, She's saying that the Jews really, you cannot consider them as foreigners. So that's the, the first big difference is that Jews have been there, so they're not foreigners. Then, of course, foreigners, Muslims, people from a lot of different countries who arrive use some of the same tactics and techniques. In other words, they're restricted by laws, they learn the laws, and they find a way around it. In that way, they're similar. But again, what's most important is to keep in mind that there's really a hierarchy among the foreigners and that the Jewish community, having been continuously in Italy so long, it has no sense to, th to in, in no sense could they be considered foreigners. Right. Ma eh, la gerarchia degli stranieri vede al primo posto gli ebrei e così anche la gerarchia dei convertiti, un musulmano convertito è interessante ma fino a un certo punto, poi sei schiavo ancora meno. E poi ci sono anche i protestanti. Allora quello che viene fuori è che ritorna, fa ritornare al caso di Roma è che Roma come Livorno per esempio e come le comunità più interessanti eh, attira una grande marea di stranieri cioè non è la città compatta chiusa, papale è una città che attira moltissimi stranieri e questo cambia moltissimo la, la prospettiva della storia per esempio, fino a poco tempo fa si diceva che i musulmani in Italia non c'erano, invece ci sono, anche stabili come tu pensai. Ok, so, um, the first point is that, uh, like this idea of a hierarchy of foreigners, it's very important that within the convert community, again, uh, for, from a Christian perspective, an Ital uh, a Jew that converts is very different from a Muslim, particularly if a Muslim was a slave who converts. So there's a hierarchy there too. The aim of the Christians to really convert the Jewish community. Uh, having said that, the other thing is that... to convert more Jews than, than Muslims or, or yeah. Africans? Yes, yes, yes. 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 Yeah. North Africa. But then, again, this conception of these cities, Rome or Livorno, were very different, but even in papal times, Rome was not a um, closed, monolithic papal city. Actually, it was a magnet for foreigners from all over the world. So, in the 20th century, right now, with this idea, this, this uh, false idea that Muslims have began arriving in Italy and parts of Europe only in recent years. In fact, her archival uh, research shows that there were Muslims that were more or less stably in Italy at that time as well. So, um, so the point is that Rome and Livorno and many of these cities were really attracting people from all over the world. And so the minorities arriving in these places often encounter similar kinds of problems, discriminations, and tactics to integrate. About attend. the history of slavery, I'm guessing we have a contact zone, and it's in the terminology. 
everybody, as we know, in, in, in the papal and in the church laws, the Jews are always defined as a servos. The what? Servos. Servos. The Jews are servos. We have a compassion. It's difficult to translate servos. Servos could be slaves or could be servants. It's different. They were, but, but they're not considered Lately, we have a contact yeah. point. Yeah. Yeah. There is a contact point. Let me just like bring up another comparative aspect as long as we've learned. Sorry, we have a question. Yes. Yeah, oh, there's a question here, yes. sorry. Let's go back to Venice. Oh, I'm interested. <laughs> 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 take the boat, take the gondola, <laughs> we'll float back. I'm interested in social restraints and from examples that I know that go against that. I want to use the case of uh, Shylock, but the real case where he gets a contract where he's actually signing over his blood to the to the Christian, and, and it's illegal to have the contract, so he's got to pay the fine, and the Christian, it's illegal. So they both pay the fine, they both go their merry ways, fine. All right, what I'm interested in, uh, Merchant, uh, the Jew of Malta, same, and maybe Venice controlled Malta at the time, or maybe Genoa did, but the same situation. He's making decisions, he's doing it on his own. There's no group of rabbis coming along. There's no social group saying, hey, this is a stupid thing to do. It'll shine badly on us. It's like individualism in these two cases that are making their decisions without that kind of constraint. Of course, my theory is that this is Englishmen that are writing this, and their idea is aristocratic. These guys are aristocrats. They got servants, they've got people that, you know, so they would act along in an aristocratic way. In other words, ignore everybody else. I am the guy. On the other hand, 50 years later with Da Costa and his heresy in Holland, all you see in, in all the reactions are groups of rabbi, groups of Jews saying, get out, you can't do this, this is crazy. So it is a shift there, definitely. Of course, my, my theory there would be guilds are important in Holland. So there's this group mentality all the time. So uh, who's right on that? Uh, would there have been a group of Jews preventing those kinds of misbehaviors of let's say the Shylock character signing you know bogus agreements and the Jew of Malta behaving badly. <laughs> I try. I'm not studying Venice at the moment. I think that, of course, a single individual could face a trial and a question without a rabbinical uh, protection. I, I think that the case of Shylock is interesting, it's real in this point, that it's one Jew who is standing on and speaking with Christian Christian authorities. I think... Okay. And this is the case, and it, this is the, norm, the normality. It's possible for Jews to speak, to have a position, to to argue yeah. with Christian authorities. The, the case is strange because there is a doctor who is going to marry a Christian. So as a Jew, Shylock was a loser, as a Jew. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, <laughs> sì, eh, però, um, non è così strano. Cioè, gli ebrei non è che se non avevano voce, o, cioè, quello che noi stiamo cercando di fare, come insieme a molti altri studiosi ovviamente nel mondo, è quello di far vedere eh, che lo stereotipo dell'ebreo passivo, lagnoso, lamentoso, che piange, che non fa niente, non esiste. Ok, her research, as well as that of scholars in many other places, demonstrates that this notion of a Jew 
always lamenting, always complaining, and basically in a position of total passivity was not the case. I mean, but a Jew who wanted to stand up and argue directly with uh, Christian authorities exists. There are cases like that. And so that this idea, generalized idea of the Jew as only the victim, lamenting, passive. complaining, and being passive to these things. The tearing the history of the Jews. Yes. Per esempio, uh, abbiamo trovato moltissime proteste. Alcune, nel caso dei battesimi forzati, sono molto forti, molto dure. Tanto che il Papa risponde mh, in maniera molto netta, molto secca perché eh, gli ebrei avevano la consapevolezza di una serie di privilegi, consuetudini che erano rispettate nel tempo e che a un certo punto non sono più rispettate e quindi protestano in maniera molto forte. Ma come facevano a protestare? Loro non avevano legali, era impedita la professione di avvocato, quindi usavano avvocati cristiani a cui suggerivano le argomentazioni e quindi noi abbiamo tutta una serie di dossier di proteste, di denunce ma anche piuttosto come si può dire esplicita insomma to further this idea that they did not uh, passively uh, uh, they were not subject passively to these legislation she's saying that there are cases, many cases in the case when we're talking about forced baptism in in Venice and other places that Jews complained and complained very, very strongly and outspokenly. Now the problem there was that they could not have, they could not be lawyers themselves. There were no Jewish lawyers, so they had to hire Christian lawyers to whom they explained what the situation was. And then, and then they, through these lawyers, they forcefully complained directly to the Pope in some cases. And so, you know, in the absence of this frame of legal protection, They were, their strength was um, kind of uh, what the habits had been up to that point. So the minute that the church or a particular pope would change these things, they would be very vocal of, in sustaining what had happened up to then. We have a comment on this Yeah, point. I have a comment on this. this uh, Jews had access to power, and that's a very important point to remember. That concept of the Jew that uh, is victimized, it's a very much 19th century and very much coming out of the era of emancipation and from Germany almost, uh, of the downtrodden uh, Jew. Um, the, uh, they had access to power, to papacy, to monarchs, to in other places. And even if you look yes. at legal documents that set up framework of the privileges, you can see Jewish voice. You can see the no uh, the, we are talking about mediation and negotiation. You can see that there are points within these privileges that are clearly not thought up by these Christian uh, lawyers, but are brought in by Jews to be included in these things. So they have they have voice and they have access to power. Can I just add one element? The, mm -hmm. This notion of the, the, the victim Jew, the powerless Jew, was very strong in the German historiography exactly. of the 19th century. So, and we're, we're still dealing with this. It's because that's when Jewish history was beginning to be written. So what we're doing now is we're actually undoing a lot of that, <laughs> that historiography, a lot of those ideas that have been embedded in the way we think of Jewish history. So what we can do now is to teach students to respect the historiography, but also to go beyond and to look at Jewish history with new models, keeping in mind that Jews are embedded, like human beings, in their society. And they are subject to the same. Yes, I think Anna Fowler calls this the new history. And she, her book is from an Italian, was in the 1990s. And she talks about this to, um, to leave behind this view of the Jew, to see him as an active participant in his own history, to see the ghetto period also as um, a period in which he wasn't, uh, the restraint was um, not so great as we, as we always imagined it, to see the Jew as, as active rather than passive. Mm -hmm. And I think this history is the one that's, that's being written today and we yes. see it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was very much impressed by the movie Il Confortorio, which was about the Jews who took uh, a thief who they couldn't control 
from the ghetto, and he gave, and gave them him to the authorities, to the to the papal authorities, and said, "We can't control them." <laughs> so, and the movie was moving, and many reasons for many reasons because the um, the order that was to try and to uh, make him convert yeah. the confortorio that the, they they tortured him for two days because. He could not die a Jew. He had to die. Um, he, they were going to kill him, but he had to die a, a Christian. And he was tortured for several days. You hear the screaming. Luckily, you don't see it. And he did. He, would get, he refused to convert, and he died. And so you see that Jews in the ghetto decided themselves that this was a person who was not good for the social uh, situation in the ghetto, and they gave him over to the authorities to... Uh, yes, to if I, be, it, yes it's it's if I may comment, I think this is a very, very good point and perhaps a point that has not been touched upon yeah, so far. passive action. This well, is very active. the Jews are f essential to Catholic theology. Yeah. No. They cannot be eliminated. Right. They have no, to be to converted. Living example and this is their yeah. weakness and their yes. strength mm -hmm. because it's, it's, it's a central point, symbol central point. of Christian uh, truth, mm -hmm. the the conversion yeah. of the Jew is so the fact that cannot be eliminated differentiates this kind the the Catholic anti-Judaism mm -hmm. for any other form of anti-Semitism mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. physical elimination is, is sufficient mm -hmm. and a possibility the possibility is sufficient to imagine a world without Jews. Mm -hmm. This is not, not <laughs> true saw. for Catholicism and it's not, not true for Italy and and this yeah. is uh, I think reflects throughout the course of history, yeah. all the way to fascist anti-Semitism. This is very true, and very important, because already at the beginning of the story, not only at the end of the story, not only in the 900, but also at the beginning of the story, the solution for the Jews is the ghetto, the isolation, everything that they want, but not the catch-up as they did the Spanish, because they have to be there. Questo è importante. E poi volevo aggiungere un'altra cosa sulla passività. No, no, traduci prima questo. Ok, so she's, 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 she's agreeing with what Natalia just saying, underlying the fact that uh, in Italy what's specific is that the idea of uh, separating and establishing the Jew, putting the Jews in the ghetto was not a late idea, but it was intrinsic from the beginning of the history until, uh, you know, yeah, so but Italy had their own way of dealing with the Jews and the Italian way was putting them in the ghetto, not the Spanish way for instance with the expulsion. That was not a possibility. The Pope always kept them there. They wanted them there. It was, it was not one of the possibilities. The second point she wants to make is again regarding uh, passivity. Pa Jewish passivity. Yes. Eh, era importante, volevo dire una cosa, questa uh, non passività è eh, interessante che riguarda anche le donne che sono considerate eh, ovviamente anche quelle più resistenti alla conversione eh, lei ha fatto l'esempio del confortorio ma non è necessario arrivare alla morte alla, quasi alla morte eh, nella casa dei catecumini eh, ci sono stati degli esempi di resistenza molto interessanti io ho pubblicato il diario di Anna del Monte 18, una ragazza, una, girl, 18, una ragazza di 18 anni che scrive il diario della sua resistenza e dice non voglio assolutamente convertirmi, si oppone in tutti i modi perché vuole morire, è nata giudia e vuole morire giudia is uh, Roman uh, <laughs> Jew, Jew language. So, so she wanted to add this idea of passivity, the lack of Passivity is particular. I mean, it's it's true of Jews in general, but also specifically of women who are the ones who are harder to convert. In fact, and so she has written about Anna del Monte, who was one of the young girls who, at, eight, at the age of 18, was brought into the Casa dei Catecumeni. And unlike the character in the film Il Confrontorio, she was stubborn and determined to feel that she was born Jewish and she was going to die Jewish. So these. Um, reports or these uh, documents showing that there was indeed uh, resistance to this thing, particularly from women, is well documented and she has studied it.
I just, I think, I just she wanted died. to clarify two things. What? No, no, no. She, 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 I, no, want, no. Uh, uh, I want to clarify two no. things. No. One that in Confortorio, no. the convert, no. yes. in Confortorio, they were not. They were conversos, Marranos. The first converted, and then yeah. in the eyes of the Pope, yeah. became right. heretic. And they were killed for that, yes, and yes. they died rather than reneged. Renegati, perché erano apostati. Eh, eh, sono stati condannati perché si sono convertiti e poi sono ritornati al giudaismo. Yeah, you're both. Uh, an excuse for killing. Yeah, of course, of course. Of But there is. I just want to clarify. In Confortorio, we're talking about a, a trial for uh, a theft. Yes. Now, and the issue is that the church does not want to kill two people who soul who have no soul, and this, and so they're they they're not gaining anything. I mean, they're really killing um, Body. bodies. Yes. If they kill them as Christians, they will liberate their souls. I mean, there is a, 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 a they, they were going to be killed no matter what. <laughs> it's just that the church wants them to die as Christians, and not, so they're going to die anyway. Anna del Monte, on the other hand, is a, s a subject of a, con of a historiographical controversy because some consider it an actual diary of a, a, a girl uh, who existed in reality, and some consider it as an exemplary tale written to, um, to, to, in, to have an impact on the resistance of, of Jews. And others just think that it was written by a, a family member or anyway. But it's uh, I just wanted to, uh, to, to bring up that there is a, a controversy over this, this diary. Yeah, I was just going to ask, these diaries I was going to ask, where did you find these diaries? Where are they located? Can they be read? Are they documents that are located? No. Dunque, il diario di Anna del Monte è stato pubblicato negli anni Ottanta da Sermoneta, da Giuseppe Sermoneta. In italiano. È il diario in italiano con dei piccoli pezzi in ebraico, con i salmi e dimostra la, la cultura forte della presunta autrice, poi lì bisognerebbe discutere. E, um, e io, siccome non si trovava più, ed è un testo bellissimo da leggere, è veramente è un racconto, anzi è, è un dramma, un dramma eh, con personaggi, allora l'ho ripubblicato tre anni fa e quindi si può avere, si può leggere. The origin of Darwin uh, non si sa perché è sparito. So oh, maybe it's it, maybe is maybe is in the Vatican. Maybe in qualche casa privata. Yeah. Maybe. Oh, maybe is in the Vatican. Who knows? <laughs> Jews of Rome, everything is. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> probably it, it is in Jerusalem. <laughs> in a private home in Jerusalem. When you're from the University of Rome, University of Rome. Do you have archives there that can be researched by intended researchers? In the university, no. Uh, the university is not uh, an uh, has a, a big bibliotheque, a big uh, archive of history uh, of the university, but not. I, I, I think th there is a misunderstanding. The, we work at universe at uh, ancient words say in the law in the ancient law to speak about. The Jewish communities, they use the words universitas, ah. you know. So maybe this is the ah. misunderstanding. Ah. Yeah, her no. question is where, no. where, no. where did your archival where? Where? Uh, research The archival services are in the <coughs> state archives, in the Roman state archives. The Roman state archives. The Roman state archives, yes. the Vatican archives, yeah, in the both in the, secret archi in the secret archives, uh, 
both in the Inquisitional Archives. Yeah, in the community oh, archives. We have a special commission. We have a fantastic website. It's a fantastic website. It's a, I, I, I was impressed with the fear of the last question and then we go. Now, you touched on this and I was going to ask, I mean, I know this is a whole other subject, but because it's the, um, you know, it was, it was papal and so you said that everyone did different things in Spain, they treated the Jews differently, but weren't they taking guidance from the Vatican? And this is a huge subject, but could you say briefly, um, <laughs> no, but what was the reasoning to put Jews in ghettos if they, if the real idea was to convert them? That was the preferred thing. Okay, for convert or we'll throw you in the ghetto. Another controversy. Rather than it's, a very, it's, it's a huge question. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but, I, but I'm curious, what you know, what was the rationale? Someone wants was a comment on this. Yeah. Comment on the papers. The yeah, it is impossible yeah. to, 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 <laughs> to move something to the conversion if you can't speak to him. To him. Sì, è una domanda enorme, però io capisco che non tutti sanno qual è la storia generale degli ebrei. La, la questione è quella che ha detto Natalia, ehm, per la teologia cattolica è molto importante che gli ebrei ci siano, ci siano, sia per convertirli, ma se non li si converte per eh, dimostrare con la loro presenza degradata, umiliata, sottomessa di servi, la verità del cristianesimo perché Dio li ha puniti per il decidio e quindi la punizione deve eh, rimanere e deve essere visibile visibile no 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 now, why did the, the Pope want to keep them it has to do with a very strongly held theological uh, belief, which is what she was referring to a minute ago. Did that is, that basically, time. it's intrinsic in, theologic, in Christian theological thought that the Jews need to be converted. If they cannot be converted, they need to be kept alive because their degradation, their uh, humiliation, humiliation, humiliation is a demonstration of a truth and it all ties in with this idea <laughs> of them having killed yes. Christ. Yes. Make yes. them suffer. Yes. Yes. Having killed yes. Yes. We have a last it's comment and the last even comment. It's, 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 it's even the theory of the... It's a thesis that started with St. Augustine. It's even the theory of Verus Israel, you know, Verus is the theory of substitution. Yes. According to according to which, if Christian is the various Israel, is the various uh, preferred po people mm -hmm. by God. Uh, of course, we ha there is something who was an old, yeah. an ancient and previous Israel. Jews are the previous Israel. Mm -hmm. Now the real Israel, the real Pope like. The real people alike by God is Chris, are Christians. Mm -hmm. So I think so the question still in darkness. was yes. about policy, whether the papal policies were applied somewhere else. And I can speak about Poland, where the largest Jewish community mm -hmm. is. I've studied the Vatican and, and, and Poland. And the, the church essentially seems to operate like an empire, and they want to uh, implement their policies in their pro, uh, periphery. They can't because they have to deal with these different contexts and different power <coughs> structures. So in Poland, for instance, after Pope Paul IV issues the ghetto decree, they, the nuncio is instructed to pass it on and see whether it can be implemented in Poland. And for centuries, they'll write back, it's like, we can't do anything about it because the Jews are in Poland in this influential position and are protected mm. and this. Uh, so there is the intention of, yes, we would like this 
to be implemented, but we we can't. Are you going to be uh, really, really quick? Really quick. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I just have one quick question about, she mentioned a book, about, about the, the uh, a book about uh, forced conversions. <laughs> Ana del Monte. No, 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 the case of Zemach, who was the rabbi's son in uh, Carpentras in France in the 1760s. Just, do you cover no, that at all? No, no, no. Okay. because it's an Italian book <laughs> for Italy. <laughs> 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 so thank you very much. <laughs>